What's going on guys? The Comics Kid 2099 here. Today I want to talk to you about X-Men Forever Volume 1 by Chris Claremont and Tom Grummet. Uh, recently uh, for Black Friday slash Cyber Monday, I ordered the entire X-Men Forever series and I would like to talk to you guys about it. Uh, now I've only read Volume 1 so far, uh, but I do intend to read this entire series and talk about each volume with you for better or worse. And I'm expecting that it's going to be worse. Uh, that's not necessarily an indication of the quality of this volume, Volume 1, uh, but uh, based on my experiences with Chris Claremont's return to the X-Men uh, since he left in 1991. Uh, so basically the premise of this series is that Chris Claremont had a 16 year run on the X-Men from 1975 to 1991 and he left uh, when the second X-Men series uh, had its third issue. That was his big swan song and uh, in that issue, spoilers for a 30 year old comic, but uh, Magneto seemingly dies in that issue. And this series is basically an alternate reality that posits what would have happened if Chris Claremont never left the X-Men. Uh, this is basically saying that it picks up right off with issue three and it ignores everything that happened from 1991 all the way up to the present day. Uh, the problem with the premise of this book is that since 1991, Chris Claremont revealed a lot of what he would have done with the X-Men if he had not left. Uh, he revealed that uh, the uh, Shadow King storyline that happened shortly before X-Men issue three, that he would not have truncated that as much and that he would have drawn it out a lot more. He revealed that eventually he was going to kill off Professor X and that the X-Men were no longer going going to need a mentor figure. Uh, at one point, he was going to have Wolverine uh, be a bad guy, and uh, that was kind of done in the Enemy of the State storyline by Mark Millar. Uh, so there was a lot of stuff that he revealed. Uh, I don't remember if it was in an interview on YouTube or if it was on a blog post or something, but he basically laid out all of the things that he wanted to do if he had not left X-Men in 1991. And then he comes and does this series, and obviously he can't do exactly what he just said because we've already heard all of those ideas, and we don't want to just see exactly that in comic book form, we want to see something a little bit different. We want to be surprised. We don't want to see all of the plot twists that have already been laid out for us for free. Uh, so he has to do something a little different here than what he would have originally done. So it's being sold on a premise that's not entirely accurate. And I can't help but think that if he had not revealed everything that he wanted to do, and then he had this series and he could have done all that stuff, maybe this would have been a little bit better. But also we have all of the X-Men stuff that Chris Claremont has done since the early 2000s and a lot of it hasn't been great. Uh, you had uh, his return to Uncanny in the very late 90s, right before uh, Grant Morrison started on New X-Men and Joe Casey started on Uncanny. And uh, I haven't read a lot of that, uh, but it was okay, and then it led into Extreme X-Men, which was really not very good, and then that led back into Uncanny X-Men, which was okay, and then around that time we had X-Men The End, which was unreadable, and then we had, uh, I don't remember if it was Exiles and then Excalibur, or Excalibur and then Exiles, uh, but that stuff was not great, and then uh, we went uh, back to uh, Nightcrawler, uh, which was a solo uh, Nightcrawler series, and that was actually not half bad, uh, but a lot of what he's done in the 21st century uh, with the X-Men is nowhere near as good as what he did in the 70s, 80s, and very early 90s. And I feel like uh, that is uh, true here, even if he had gotten to use all the ideas uh, that he originally wanted to use if he had never left the book in 1991. Uh, so I haven't really talked a lot about what is going on here. So basically, uh, this picks up uh, right with the X-Men returning to Earth from Asteroid M, and uh, they are chasing down Fabian Cortez at the behest of S.H.I.E.L.D. And Fabian Cortez gets away, and uh, there's immediately something weird going on where Cortez attacks them, but he says he is not the one who brought their plane down. So someone else brought the plane down. And we see here that unlike in the original uh, Marvel continuity, uh, he here, Gene and Logan apparently are having an affair and have been in love with each other for quite some time. I'm not entirely sure how that lines up with the X-Men comics that allegedly take place before this because Gene had just joined the X-Men from X-Factor like right before this so it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that these two are now passionate lovers and that they have been hiding this love affair from everybody uh, but that's neither here nor there. I feel like uh, Claremont is trying his best to shake things up and change things so that they are not exactly the way that they were in the X-Men continuity that we got after he left. So in that X-Men continuity, Scott and Jean eventually got married. And in that continuity, Wolverine stayed alive and became an integral part of the X-Men and arguably was an integral part of the X-Men even before Chris Claremont left. And then you have characters like uh, Rogue and uh, Gambit who became a uh, Ross and Rachel type couple uh, shortly after uh, Claremont left. And that was something that uh, actually I want to say that uh, flirtation between them started immediately after Claremont left. But uh, anyway, he's kind of trying to do things different here 
character just so that he can say, look, this is not the same X-Men continuity that you've come to love. Uh, so uh, immediately, spoilers for this book, uh, he kills off Wolverine. Uh, they uh, fumble the uh, capture of Fabian Cortez. Uh, they do capture him, but uh, it doesn't end well uh, because uh, Wolverine, he gets injured and Jean is like, hey, you need to take it easy. You could die. Dun, dun, dun. He dies. Uh, and we don't know who kills him. Uh, we eventually find out that it's Storm who kills Wolverine. And apparently she is the one who brought down the X-Jet because, uh, or the Blackbird, whatever they're calling it, uh, because uh, they kept talking about how uh, whatever it was that brought them down, it wasn't on the radar. Uh, Gene did not sense anything telepathically. Something brought them down, and Fabian Cortez says it wasn't him, but he's going to try and take advantage of that anyway. And uh, for some reason, Storm has decided to betray the X-Men. Uh, she is working for an organization called the Consortium, and we do not know, Consortium or Consortium, I, I don't know how that's pronounced, uh, but we do not know what these guys have against the X-Men. We don't know why Storm betrayed the X-Men, but we find out that she had a teenage clone, maybe, uh, in her closet at the mansion and Wolverine sneaks into Storm's room and smells something and goes in the closet and finds this little kid version of Storm and then the adult Storm kills him whenever he finds the little kid version and this is weird because it's trying to use some of the continuity that takes place before X-Men issue 3 but it's also seemingly ignoring a lot of the continuity from before X-Men issue 3 because at one time at one point before Claremont left the X-Men books uh, Storm was turned into a little girl and then was turned back into adult uh, during the events of the Extinction Agenda. And uh, she had met uh, Gambit and that was actually how Gambit was introduced whenever she was a little girl. And then uh, he was kind of introduced to the X-Men that way. And uh, this says, okay, this is maybe the real Storm. Uh, she's at least not a bad guy, uh, but they're not entirely sure if she's the real Storm or if the real Storm just decided to go evil and work with these consortium guys and try to kill uh, the X-Men. But uh, for some reason, uh, adult Storm, she betrays them and then she runs away and uh, I haven't even gotten to Kitty Pride yet. She's pretty important here. Uh, but uh, we don't really know what's going on with Storm here. I assume that it's going to be uh, picked up on later on in the series. Uh, there's like eight volumes total. So I think that they're going to get to that subplot later, I hope. Uh, because I am interested, why is Storm a bad guy here? And I think this is another one of those things where Claremont, he did not have plans for Storm to be a bad guy originally. But whenever he has the opportunity to do his own X-Men series that is allegedly a sequel to X-Men issue 3, he says, well, well, why the heck not? Let's just say that Storm is a bad guy, and uh, he's known for doing some of these long-running mysteries uh, whenever he has a lot of time to do it. Uh, I don't know if eight volumes is enough for him to really get into that. Uh, I have this lingering fear that he's not going to address that, but we'll see. Uh, but anyway, Storm, for some reason, uh, she is now working with these consortium guys who are operating against the X-Men, and then Sabretooth just shows up out of nowhere. Like, immediately after Wolverine dies, he shows up at the mansion, and he tries to kill Storm because she killed Wolverine, who is in this continuity, his son. And uh, I don't like this because uh, Sabretooth is uh, treated here like he's just a misunderstood, angry anti-hero. And they're like, yeah, you're one of our worst enemies, but we're going to let you work with us from now on. And uh, as you can see from some of the covers, uh, well... Uh, there we go. Uh, this is volume five, uh, but Sabretooth, he sticks around. Uh, he remains a part of the team, and he's basically Logan Light here. Uh, he has Wolverine's personality. He's gruff, he's grumpy, but he's still got a heart of gold, and he can be counted on whenever they need him. And that's problematic because this takes place after the Mutant Massacre, which uh, was well before Claremont left the X-Men books, and Sabretooth was a psychopath who murdered a lot of innocent mutants in the Morlock Tunnels. But this is pretending like none of that ever happened and that he is basically the new Wolverine and I have to ask why would you even kill Wolverine if you're just going to bring Sabretooth in and treat him exactly like Wolverine? He's written exactly like Wolverine. It's almost like they just did a die job on Wolverine and then they blinded him. Uh, spoilers, uh, they blinded him, but I don't know if that gets undone or not. Uh, I should also mention that uh, I had read uh, all of the contents of this book when it was coming out. I remember everyone got really excited when this series was announced, and then after the series started, I didn't hear a whole lot about this series after that. Uh, so I have no idea what's in store for the series beyond this volume, but uh, this was right around the time when my local comic book shop uh, was about to close down, uh, but I read all these issues, I believe it's five issues of this volume, I read all of them when it was coming out, and then I decided I didn't really like the series enough to keep going, uh, the next volume uh, was about a flashback story with Nick Fury and Wolverine, and I really didn't want a multi-part arc with those two in a flashback, uh, so I stopped reading before uh, the events
Minutes of Volume 2. So uh, beyond this volume, I have no idea what we've got coming, uh, but uh, I am interested. I am uh, very cautiously optimistic uh, because sometimes Claremont can deliver the goods and sometimes uh, he doesn't really do uh, nearly as good as he used to be able to do. And I'm hoping that this being in its own little universe, not connected to the rest of the Marvel Universe, that he was able to just do whatever he wanted and he could produce something at least enjoyable. Maybe not as high quality as what he used to do back in the 80s, but at least enjoyable. Uh, because a lot of times uh, when he was working in the X-Men books in the main Marvel Universe in the 21st century, uh, it seemed to me like he was doing stuff and then he was interrupted by plans by editorial. Like he was doing Extreme X-Men and then they had these plans to kind of shuffle around everything. Joss Whedon's coming, so he gets to have whatever X-Men he wants and then you can go back to Uncanny and you get to have uh, what's left of the team that you want, but we're going to cancel this Extreme team and then we're going to have to kind of change the premise a little bit. So now uh, the Uncanny team, they carry badges, which Extreme, they did not, and stuff like that. Or uh, he's working on Uncanny and then Grant Morrison is coming along and that actually happened before Joss Whedon, but you know what I mean. And so uh, anyway... I'm hoping that this being in its own little world, the editorial could basically just say, do whatever you want. Your name is going to sell comics with hardcore X-Men fans. Uh, so we will see. Uh, also, uh, I'm not done talking about the book. Uh, there's actually quite a bit here uh, to discuss. But uh, Kitty Pride, this is really dumb. Okay, so... Uh, Cortez is talking, uh, is uh, touching Wolverine. Uh, that sounded gross. Uh, he is touching Wolverine, and his powers basically amp up another mutant's abilities. And then Kitty Pride tries to grab Wolverine and pull him away from Cortez, and then she gets kind of sucked in on this little weird uh, energy manipulation thing. And then after that, for like two more issues, she keeps saying, Man, my arm hurts. And then they find Wolverine's skeleton, and it's missing a claw. Dun dun dun! It turns out that Kitty Pride has one of Wolverine's claws somehow bonded to her. Now, this is dumb because Wolverine has a skeleton with adamantium bonded onto it. Now, I guess you could say that uh, this takes place right after X-Men issue 3 and the revelation that Wolverine had uh, skeleton claws, bone claws, that did not happen until after the Onslaught Saga or uh, sometime during the Onslaught Saga whenever uh, his metal had been ripped from him. So, technically, uh, maybe this version of Wolverine does not have skeleton claws. Maybe somehow they just added the claws in and his mutant ability was just his healing factor. Okay, maybe but it still doesn't make sense that somehow Kitty touching Wolverine while Cortez was touching Wolverine, somehow that transfers one claw, just one, from Wolverine's body into Kitty's body perfectly, so now she can sneak at that claw out anytime she wants, and she can use it a lot like Wolverine used all six claws. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. At one point, when we see Wolverine sneaking around in Storm's room, he doesn't stop to say, hey, that's weird, I only have five claws now. Uh, that's really dumb, and also it's just really dumb that Kitty Pride has one of his claws. I don't know why. Uh, I guess Claremont wanted to make Kitty more of a bad butt, uh, but why. Um, Kitty was always kind of the cute, innocent one. And I know Claremont has a big thing for Kitty. He likes Kitty, one of his favorite characters. I've never cared about Kitty, especially in the early issues where she was first introduced. I really hated Kitty Pride. Uh, here, she's okay. Uh, it doesn't really make sense that she's actually in the book, because if you read the first three issues of that X-Men series, you have characters like Forge, Banshee, Archangel, Colossus, Mori McTaggart. None of them are here, even though they were in those issues. And then you have Nightcrawler and Kitty Pride here, and they were not in those issues. Now, at one point, Nightcrawler and Kitty are talking about how they were in Excalibur, and now they're good. It's good to be back. Doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Uh, now, technically, on this book, nowhere does it say picking up with X Men issue three. Uh, pretend like uh, this is a sequel to those comics. That is what it was billed as. I remember when the series first started coming out, they actually did X Men Forever issue zero, which was basically a 90 page uh, recap of the first three issues of that X Men series. So you could read that and then jump right into X Men Forever issue one. Uh, that is not collected here, uh, but uh, it was basically just reprinting those three issues. But uh, they were not shy about billing this as a continuation of Chris Claremont's original run. Uh, here, they don't specifically say, go reread those issues and then ignore everything else, uh, but it is still a little weird that they throw Kitty Pride and Nightcrawler in here when those two had nothing to do with those issues, and then they take away several characters who actually did have something to do with those issues. Uh, so, and yeah, technically, uh, there were a whole bunch of X-Men at that point, uh, basically two teams were, since they kind of split off into Uncanny and X-Men at that point, uh, but uh, I would have liked at least an explanation of where 
Where's Archangel? Where's Forge? Where are all these guys? Why did Kitty and Nightcrawler suddenly come back and join the X-Men? Uh, I'd like an explanation of that, uh, but they don't bother doing that. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, this series uh, is so far proving to be okay. I am interested in the mystery of the Consortium. Uh, I'm not too keen on the idea of S.H.I.E.L.D. basically micromanaging the X-Men. Uh, Nick Fury talks about how the X-Men have lived in the shadows long enough. The entire world is afraid of them. Even though they have saved the universe like twice, he says, that just makes them more afraid of you, which doesn't make any sense. And so in this series, it seems like S.H.I.E.L.D. is going to be taking a very active part of the X-Men. Uh, that kind of reminds me of right after House of M, when S.H.I.E.L.D. had all those Sentinels guarding the X-Men. I'm not okay with that. I don't like that. I like the X-Men to just be off doing their own thing. Uh, they can be part of the Marvel Universe. They can have interactions with the Avengers or the Fantastic Four or whatever, but I don't want S.H.I.E.L.D. to be basically in charge of the X-Men. But I guess we'll see what happens. That's another example of Claremont trying to make this different than the Marvel Universe that we already have. Uh, but uh, anyway, I guess we'll see where this goes. Uh, there's some good and some bad here. Sabretooth just being one of the gang, uh, that's going to be really dumb and it's going to take a lot of legwork for them to make me accept that. Uh, Kitty being all grouchy and, ooh, I have a claw now. That's kind of stupid. Uh, I'm very interested to see what they do with Adult Storm. Uh, so, uh, anyway, those are my thoughts on... I shuffle these books. Here we go. Uh, those are my thoughts on X-Men Forever picking up where we left off. Uh, I hope that you guys liked this video, and if you did, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I will be back later with another video. In the meantime, you guys have a great rest of the day. Catch you later.